1 Thessalonians chapter 5, starting in verse 1, we've spent three weeks talking about the rapture and the resurrection and the return of Christ and also the second coming. And I thought we were finished, but as we get into chapter 5, I'd be remiss if we didn't spend some time in these first several verses because they're touching on some of the very same issues and context, particularly this context of the day of the Lord. A believer should know what the expression, the day of the Lord, means. And I want to make sure by the end of this message, you feel fully equipped to be able to explain what is the day of the Lord. Please come along with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And it says this. But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, you know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction cometh upon them As travail comes upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. There are so many verses that tell us that we cannot know the times and the seasons of the rapture. But we can certainly know the times and the seasons of the return also known as the second coming. So let me say this again, which is similar to last week. The book of Revelation as well as other specific proclamations, even in the Old Testament, make it very clear that we can know when Christ is coming. We can know when Christ is coming with his church. But no man knows the times and the seasons when Christ is coming for his church, which is the rapture of the church. We've spent three weeks on this, but we're going to revisit it in these opening verses because, as I mentioned in the introduction to last week's message, this is the reason God led me to the Thessalonian books to explain the rapture, to explain the second coming. And part of that is understanding what is the day of the Lord. And I don't want to rush the rapture. If you've listened to me for any degree of time, even in the past 20 years, you know that I don't want to rush anything that God has to say. In fact, I think I actually really struggled with other leaders who felt that I wasn't going fast enough through the Bible, and that was part of the reason we're no longer affiliated with our past affiliation back, you know, a decade ago, was because they felt I wasn't going fast enough through the Scriptures. I believe that a depth of knowledge on any one passage of the scripture is better than a general knowledge of the entire Bible, right? If we're going to grow and and deepen and develop and get rooted and established in the faith, it takes more than just a cursory glance at the scriptures. Let's go deep and see what God has to say. So in light of that, I'm going to double back to this day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? Maybe you've got somewhat of a handle on the Bible, and in the book you know that the day of the Lord has something to do with the book of Revelation, and if you think that, you're right. What many of us may not know is the concept of the day of the Lord, the concept is being communicated in this phrase, it goes way back. It goes way back. When sin enters into the world, In the opening chapters of Genesis, we see its effects immediately. Isolation, envy, jealousy, struggles for power. Just like Satan said in the presentation of the fruit, that there was a longing to be on the same level with God. And not only do we see that in the garden being the promotion of the temptation, but there's a culmination in Genesis chapter 11 in a region that would be called Babel. What does Babel have to do with the day of the Lord? Okay, man, really follow me, please, because I'm going to communicate concepts that are going to crisscross, and then, want to know, Chris? And then it's going to come together. If you're from the 80s, we know what that was. If you don't, just keep going. Ironically, here's what happens in Genesis chapter 11, and see how this is a shadow of what happened in the garden. Ironically, the people of the lower world attempt to literally elevate themselves to the place 
of God, thinking that would make them equal to God. And they literally do this, setting their own standards now in this elevated place, literally in this elevated place, they think they're going to find new standards of right and wrong, new standards of good and evil, and perhaps throw some standards away completely until one day, in the midst of tower construction with all their hard hats and OSHA and what have you, God completely confounds them with the destruction and the deconstruction of their communication. Fascinating. Babylon is important. So why are you talking about Babylon? Babylon's important to understand because from this point on, watch this now, from this point on, Babylon becomes a symbolic metaphor in the Bible referring to the, to the world systems that are set against God. That's what Babylon means when it's mentioned in the scriptures. They're the world systems that are set against God. This babalic, symbolic system is seen again in Egypt. That's why it's fascinating that we're somehow dovetailing Dr. Emmons right now in our passages and in our messages. It's seen in Egypt... And they celebrate their victory over their bondage in Egypt with a song. Miriam sings, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. And they celebrate this and they call it, you know what they call it? The day. They call it the day. And for those of us here who have a Jewish background, you know that when you have the Passover service, you actually mention and you prepare, it, you pair, prepare an empty seat for who? Someone tell me. I, I, I saw Stephanie here. For Elijah, because at the Passover feast, they celebrate that there's going to come another day where Elijah is going to return. So we leave a seat at the Seder for Elijah. And when they do, they actually quote the book of Malachi, where it talks about how Elijah is going to return. Now, they do this at every Passover Seder, and then the week after at the synagogue, they read this passage in celebration of what's called the day, and they do it every year ever since Passover. Now, are you still with me? Say yes. Okay. Israel. Yay. Okay. Over time, they begin to become this great nation. And in the midst of being a great nation, these prophets begin to rise up. And these prophets begin to tell people what God has to say. What's a prophet? A prophet is someone who tells the people what God has to say. And in one particular instance, there's a man named Amos. And he had a terrifying and shocking revelation about the day of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. Isn't the day of the Lord when Babylonian systems are devoured and vanquished? Amos says the day of the Lord is coming again, but this time the focus is not Egypt. This time the focus is, are you ready for this? Israel. Wait, what? It's not Egypt, it's Israel itself. And it happens. Just like Babel, just like Egypt, God intervenes and God deconstructs Israel, its kingdoms, its powers, authorities, and they go through a series of captivities. Syria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and other countries take them over for centuries. And in the midst of all that, don't miss this thread. The prophets are still speaking, even in the midst of captivity, and they're telling them, they're reminding them, God still loves his people. And God still has a covenant with them. And he's going to make good on that covenant. And God's still going to establish his rule. And God's still going to establish his reign over any Babylonian world-like systems that are set against him. And they're hoping in that, in the midst of this captivity. So I'm going to take like 50 centuries and wrap it up in a succinct summation of the day of the Lord so we can look at this and then look at a few more scriptures before we close. So are you ready? Give me a real, if you are ready. Scream it. All right, here we go. Watch this. Stick with me. We're going for a ride. Israel continues for centuries under oppressive authorities. When Christ comes... The Babylonian-like world system that is set up against God is then, at this time, it's called Rome. And Christ comes into the midst of this tyrannical, dictatorial regime. So what does Christ do? 
Huh? Did he come in on a white horse with garments of brilliance and destroy them with the sound of his voice? Yeah? No. Actually, he comes riding in on a donkey. And his garments are the garments of a common everyday rabbi. And the voice of Jesus is crying. His voice is weeping because he knows what's about to take place. And incredibly, mysteriously, enigmatically, miraculously, he rescues them. Watch this. And all of us from the foundation of the rebellion. Hmm? What, the foundation of the rebellion? Yeah, Christ goes right to the source of the system that's set against God. Oh, what's the system? Sin. He doesn't just deal with the systems. He deals with the source. That's why he's the savior. So establishing himself as the sinless sacrifice to pay for, to atone for, to redeem, to ransom, to rescue from the penalty of our own sin, Christ becomes the savior on the cross. Yeah, that's worth getting excited about. And as if that wasn't enough, he rises again three days later to show that not only is he the, the savior over death, but he also gives eternal life. He's born into the nation of Israel, and he comes to proclaim to the nation of Israel that there's another day. And it wasn't just about Passover. In fact, you search the scriptures, right, Jesus said, because in them you think they have eternal life. And when you read them, you'll find out they speak of me. Why? Because Jesus is the Passover lamb. John sees him and says, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So here he is, the Passover lamb, sacrificed, our sacrifice, rises again to not only provide for sin, but then give us eternal life. And he is the the day. He is the other day. This is another day of the Lord. It's a day of deliverance. That's when Jesus, when he came traveling in on Palm Sunday, they were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. What does that mean? Save us now, save us now, son of David. They were waiting for the day, the ultimate day where Israel would come back again, the way that God delivered them in the past. Now, tragically, Israel does not accept this day. The nation does not accept this as the day of the Lord, which was prophesied, this is fascinating, was prophesied in the Psalms, Psalm 118 in particular. It said this, and Jesus quoted it, and he said this of himself. Did you not read that the stone that the builders rejected that that becomes the chief cornerstone. So when the nation of Israel is like building their kingdom, their own Babel, if you will, they see a stone and they say, what, this one? And And the masons and the professionals, they look at it and they say, no, they throw it in the weeds. And God says, no, 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 no. That's the chief cornerstone. That's going to be the most important stone. The stone that the builders rejected becomes the chief cornerstone, becomes the head cornerstone. And here's what's fascinating. It's Psalm 118 and why the ink is still wet on the parchment of this particular passage in the Psalms. There's another statement. Listen to this. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. In other words... We've sung, and when we close today, we'll close with that, that, that song from Sunday school. Just for kicks. But when we sing that song, and we've sung it for years, when we sing it, what do we say? Oh, well, today's a great day. Isn't today a great day? It's a day the Lord's made. Let's, let's rejoice today and be glad in today. There's nothing wrong with that. That is exactly true. And there's a fistful of scriptures that tell us that we should rejoice every day in what God has done. But when that was written into the sacred scriptures, it was written regarding Christ. The fact that he would die and rise again and begin to conquer the systems that were set against his father. So think about that as we sing it today, that it is a beautiful day. But the day that the Lord's made in which we rejoice and be glad in is the day of his death and resurrection and the coming day, which is known as the day of the Lord. Although nationally Israel wasn't recognizing it, Christ came and gave his life as a sinless sacrifice on the cross to overcome, let me say it again, I'm going to drill this down, to overcome a satanic world system that's set against God in order to, listen, in order to save our souls from sin. 
Yeah, that's what it's all about. And then he rose from the grave to show that he was victorious in his mission. He accomplished that which he came to do. And that whole thing that I just explained to you is called the gospel. So when you hear the word gospel, gospel music, gospel this, gospel tracks, whatever that is, gospel is not a culture. Gospel is a message of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. Your Christ swung open the door. You've got Matthew. You've got Ephesians. Although Christ broke the chains in Romans. So anyone could escape spiritual bondage of Babylon. This satanic Babylonian governmental system has yet to be subdued. You can watch it on the news every day. When it is, when it is, that will be the final day of the Lord. It starts with the rapture, it brings in the tribulation, it culminates in Armageddon, and then it results in celebration for a thousand years. You know where I got that? Jesse on Thursday night at our connect group. I was trying to explain all this, and Jesse's like, Dad, why don't you just tell them that it starts with the rapture, that it brings tribulation, it culminates in Armageddon, and then results in a celebration. I'm like, okay. When I teach teachers how to teach, I'm always talking about how good teachers make complex systems simple to understand. I don't want you to leave thinking, wow, he sounds really intellectual. He's really smart, right? My, jo- my job is to take a complex system and make it simple for you to understand so that you can grow from it. Or else, you know what you're done with? You're, you're left with overwhelming impressions of the pastor when really you're supposed to be left with overwhelming impressions of the Savior, right? Which is the greatest concern maybe in a lot of churches today. It's about the pastor. It's about his social media platform. It's about his... Po- his podium. <laughs> it is about my podium, but it's a whole different story. It's symbolic of something else. Yeah. All right. Just, just, I just preached myself into a corner right there. That final day of the Lord is the one being mentioned here in this Thessalonians 5 passage. Christ's resurrection, it, 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 it's, it, it's rescuing. His resurrection rescues by reversing the terrifying proclamations of those prophets. Terrifying proclamations. Christ comes, he dies on the cross and rises again and totally reverses all of that and rescues us. And then the apostle Paul continues to write. Look with me again, back into the passage in verse 4. It was very scary what I read in those first three verses about when a woman's in travail, when those birth pains start coming on, you cannot escape this. It's going to happen. Its birth is happening. But he says, but ye, you brethren, are not in darkness that, watch this, it may have got a pen you want to circle, that that day should not overtake you as a thief. That day should not overtake you as a thief. For ye all are children of photos. You are children of light. And the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Then verse 6 starts with the therefore, because now that you have that intelligence, now that you have that wisdom and understanding, here's what you ought to do in light of that. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, and love for a helmet, and hope of salvation. You have that beautiful trinity of faith, hope, and love found in that one verse. And then four, here's the reason for it all. Here's the reason that you should be excited, rejoice, live clear-minded, live watching. For God hasn't appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, and here's the and here, yeah, qualifier, here's the qualifier. Okay, why, why, our Lord, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, there's another one, finals, in light of all of that, comfort yourselves together, and, not only comfort, and edify one another, even as also ye do. You're already doing it. Just keep doing it. Keep comforting each other. 
keep edifying each other. Did you notice what was happening in that passage? These few verses were given a contrast in quick succession between light and darkness. If you've got a pen, you can go through and circle how many times you see light and darkness and night and day. And then after that, right, we're challenged in verse 6, we're challenged on how to live and how to comfort and how to encourage each other because we're not of the darkness. We are in the light. This is what I want to convince you of today and give you a concrete confidence in is that you are in the light. Okay, how do I, how do I know I'm in the light? Great question. Colossians chapter 1. I wish I had the time. This is, again, this is some, so much of what I had to cut out. But Colossians chapter 1, 13 and 14. It's Paul, and he's praying for them that they would be strengthened according to his glorious might and power so that they would endure and have patience. And he says that you'd be filled with the, the Holy Spirit and with joy and give thanks to the Father because he's enabled you to share in his inheritance because you are his adopted children. And he says, and you belong to him, you're his people, and you live live in the light. And then he says this, for, he, we live in the light? Yeah, because, for, because he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his dear son. Watch this. He rescued us from a kingdom. Here it is. This is a region. It's called darkness. And he's rescued us and, and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and he forgave our sins now watch this I'm going, to just, I'm going to get deep a powerful metaphor is mentioned here about the light see when, when in ancient times when people were captured in order to destroy the region they would deport them from where they lived when was the last time you played basketball with an Amorite Right? Because when they captured the people and conquered the people, they scattered the people so that they couldn't regroup again. So they captured them, they deported them from their homeland, and then if they didn't kill them, they enslaved them. And if that was you, your situation was like practically hopeless. The only hope that you possibly could have is that, is that you would be purchased. This is so cool. You'd be purchased by another slave owner who might actually treat you better than the one who has enslaved you. Do you see where this is going to go? Or your other hope would be that your king would come and rescue the region that was taken captive. Well, in verse 13, we're referred to as people who live in the light because we were rescued out of the kingdom of darkness and we were transferred, we were transported. If you have the King James, we were translated into the kingdom of Jesus. That's verse 13. Then verse 14 says, and also we're referred to not just as people who live in the light, but people who were purchased. And we were purchased, and we now have freedom, just like an auctioner would buy a slave off an auctioning block. We were purchased, our freedom was purchased, and now we have the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. Yeah. Colossians mixes both metaphors to present the most powerful picture possible to prove and to proclaim you are in the light. Light itself... It's such a photos, it's such a powerful metaphor, it's used throughout the entire scope of scripture. Light illuminates, light gives warmth, light gives life. What lives without light? Light is necessary for nutrients, light protects, and so many other ways in which the metaphor mixes. And think about this, when God says, in Genesis, in the opening words where the earth is void and without form and darkness covers everything and the Spirit's moving upon the waters, God says, let there be, let there be, let there be. And the first of all the things that he says, first and foremost, is let there be light. That's going to be powerful. Track me now. When promising the Messiah and promising the salvation of Israel, it says those who are in darkness will see a great light. 
when Jesus comes, there's a woman and a man that prophesy over him and say he will be a light unto the lost world, unto the lost Gentile world. Then along comes John. And John writes his letter and he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The very same was in the beginning with God, right? And the word was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. And then John says, in him was life, that's zoe, like the life principle. And that life was the light, was the photos of all anthropos. Jesus is the zoe and the photos of all anthropos. He is the life and the light of all mankind. And he goes on to say, he's the light that lighteth every man that comes into the world. And that light that shines, it shines in the darkness. And the darkness cannot comprehend it. The darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness cannot overwhelm it. And then Christ turns and looks at us in Matthew chapter 5. And he says, you are the light. You are the light of the world. Now, of course, he's the light, capital L, but we're the light, lowercase l. And then he goes on and says, not only you are the light of the world. Oh, wow, I'm, yeah, I'm the light. No, therefore, let your light so shine that they see the good things that you do and think you're cool. Like, no, so that they glorify the Father which is in heaven. The very reason that he placed his light within you and causes you to actually be light is so that you give glory to God in heaven. Romans chapter 13 tells us to cast off the deeds of darkness and put on the, listen, like, like Iron Man, like put on the armor of light. This one blows me away. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, for God, and this is what I was just saying a minute ago, for God who, who, who commanded, he spoke, and he commanded light to shine out of the darkness. You know where else he shined? He shined into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Wait, what? Like you could be there for like a week trying to just parse out what's really happening there. That the same one that said, let there be light, and light like came into the universe. Okay, he did that like with your heart. So that the light of the knowledge of the glory of God that's seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Read, read, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So that that light could shine forth from your earthen vessel. Your clay pot. He takes that light and he puts it inside of us. And then it says, so that the glory would not be of the vessel, but the glory and the authority and the power would be of God. And like, we all know that, right? That, like, I am light because he is light and I'm connected with him. And that's where I want to go with the rest of my time, which is we're going to run out quickly. So let me encourage you with this. Ephesians chapter 5 says, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord so, there, so in light of that, you're, here's the action step. Okay, so what do I do with that? So walk as children of light. I love how the scriptures always tell you who you are and then tell you what to do. Any of us here grew up in a church that was always telling you what to do? But it was exhausting because they never told you who you really are in Christ. Which leads to like legalism and like empty religiosity and obedience that really has no place where, like, it, but it's not out of thankfulness. It's just out of culture or religion or morality the reason that we should walk as children of light is because we were once darkness and now we're light it doesn't say you were in the darkness five ephesians five gets really specific and says you were darkness that was the essence of who you are now the essence of who you are is light i wish i had the time to talk about essence let me just keep going and say this God just doesn't come upon me. The Holy Spirit doesn't just fall upon me and I, I see the light. Ah! God isn't just lending me light. God is going beyond giving me light. He goes as far as to say, I have the light. I am the light. I'm telling you. Can you look at me just for a minute and give me your attention? I am the light. That's blasphemy. That would be blasphemy for me to say that 
if I wasn't reading it in God's word. That sounds like some kind of cosmic, humanistic, new age, dolphins in space theory to me. You are the light. But that's what Jesus said. And when he said it, I'm listening to the one who lived a sinless life and died for me as a sacrifice and then rose again and said, I'm coming to take you to be with me. I'm going to listen to him. Yeah. Don't listen to me. I didn't die for you and rise from the dead. Listen to Jesus. The reason I'm here is just to tell you what Jesus said. And Jesus said, you're the light of the world. Let your light so shine. And what's even more world-shaking and mind-blowing than that, today, right here in this passage, we got, I, I wish we had the time to talk about this. You are children of light. You are the children of light. All right, let me just do this, and then we'll wrap it up. You're the children of light. So what's the meaning in that metaphor? Obviously, we're not like, I wasn't like, I'm not a child of light physically. What's going on here? To be called a child or to be called children of light, the word son in the Greek or in the Hebrew or in Chaldean or in Egyptian or in Aramaic, it doesn't matter. I don't know, as far as my scholarship goes, I don't know a language where this doesn't happen. The word son, sons, daughters, child, children, they're all metaphors to be used, the sons of thunder, there were these satanic people that were called the sons of Belial, or a false god. It's used to describe sons, children, used to describe a relationship. Relationship that is so close. In fact, it's so close that this word is used, son, daughter, children, it's used as an allusion to a connotation of a metaphor regarding some sort of genetic relationship. Some sort of genetic connection. And we'll do this with other concepts, right? We'll say that like love and trust are married to each other. Have you ever used language like that? Some people say they're in bed together, which is a bit earthy, but we've used that expression and we know what we mean by that. It's a metaphor, isn't it? I remember someone telling me that they were struggling with insecurity. In fact, we just talked about this in our pre-service meeting with our team. And I, I, told, I told this person that insecurity is really pride's it's really pride's ugly little brother. And I wish I had the time to talk about it because like, insecurity and pride are actually very similar to each other because they're both overwhelming, obsessive thoughts of yourself. One's about your greatness. One's about how much you hate yourself. But they're, two, oh, they're both obsessive thoughts about yourself. So they're, they're connected. They're, they're brothers, if you will. There's another message. But I'm just saying, do you get the metaphor? Like, do a politically incorrect search this afternoon on ugly, red-headed stepchild. Because I did, and yeah. So, Peter tells us, Peter tells us in his first letter, that through believing in the resurrection, it's also called the living hope, that there's a, there's a new birth that comes out of that in those opening verses of Peter's first letter. That new birth... Follow me now. That new birth, just as my children were birthed, being partakers, my children are partakers of Stokes' DNA, Stokes' blood. They were partakers of Stokes' milk from mama. Now, Second Peter says this. Second, in his second letter, he says, you're birthed and you have, you have and you will continue to be, watch this, partakers of, of the divine nature. It's like another like crazy to me sacrilegious statement except we have the apostle Peter saying because you've been born of the spirit you're now a partaker of the divine nature. Essence, which I don't have time to talk about. Nature, they're, they're very similar words. The de definition, I'm gonna, just going to do it. We'll get, run and get your kids after this is done. All right, And I'll make this song quick. The definition of the word essence is this. That with which without can no longer be. What? Well, here, here's something right here, right? And this is made of several components. But that with which is without, it can no longer be. You take that away from what this is, you take this piece away, and you remove the essence from what it is, and it's no longer that thing. Okay. It says that we have part, we're partakers of his divine essence. 
We were created in the image of God. That's one thing. It's beautiful. We're created in the image of God. But through Jesus Christ's death and resurrection, now we're partaking in something else called his divine essence, his divine nature. Do you see where I'm going, trying to connect this with being children of the light? I'm telling you that so you can see this metaphoric illusion connotation uses geneticism in regards to being sons and daughters and children of God. I mean, the Bible, like, yes, we are ambassadors, and yes, we are warriors, and yes, we are co-laborers, and the list goes on of all the metaphors of what we are in Christ. But most of us would agree that the most powerful, the most impacting, the most inspiring and convicting of them all is that through placing your faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ and his sinless sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection from the dead, there is this spiritogenic birth that takes place in every believer. Thanks for applauding that because I made that word spiritogenic up. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say there, right? And what does it do? According to verse 6, it, it ought to, hey, yo, this ought to do something for you. This is not a theological class right now. This is supposed to do something. What? Well, it's supposed to cause you to repent from sin. Did you see this? It's supposed to cause you to wake up from your spiritual slumber. It's supposed to cause you to step out of darkness and not only come into the light but be partakers of that light. And also to have that light become the essence of this thing called new life. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are birthed, we're born again. In theology, in the university, we call this the doctrine of regeneration. Within the new birth, we now have what? We, we now what? We see... We, we've been given, we, we manifest, we hold forth light because we are children of light. And then Jesus, he goes to a whole nother level. And he says, you are light. One of my favorite verses, John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the photos of the cosmos, right? I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. But Jesus also said, having the light, walking in the light, shows that you are children of light. Here we're told something with very strong language and metaphors. So, and, and listen, because here's the practical application, and I'm going to have to leave it to you for the sake of time to make the correlation, but it tells you to be awake. Whatever that looks like for you right now in your life today, be clear-minded. Put on faith, put on hope, put on love like a soldier would put on his armor. That's powerful metaphor. Why? Because you're reborn and rescued? Yes. Because you're restored and renewed? Yes. Because you're redeemed and you're reconciled? Yes. Because you're regenerated and are awake and alive? Did I just say regenerated? That's crazy. The power of sin and bondage has been broken? Yes. Is it, because, is it because, should we put on faith, hope, and love like it's armor in the midst of a battle because we're able to rejoice with joy unspeakable, waiting for the future fulfillment of our forgiveness, which is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to ultimately give us the victory? Yes, certainly, definitely, absolutely, but yet, nevertheless, in this particular passage we're studying this morning, right now, today, we're challenged to walk out our lives in the light. Why? Because we're children of light. So I say to you, and these are my last words for you today, let the world look at you and see how your light makes you different from the dark. Can people see a tangible, practical, experiential way in which your life is different because you're not in the dark? Your attitudes and actions differentiate you from the dark. Your beliefs and your behaviors delineate you from the dark. What you do and what you say declares that you are no longer in the dark. Your life declares that you are not a daughter of a darkness. You are not the son stuck in some sort of spiritual slumber. You are a daughter. You are a son of the light. You are a child. You are children 
children of the light. Yes, God has shed his light. Yes, God gave me light. Yes, I'm supposed to reflect light, but in a mystery that is so fantastic and wild that I cannot contain, characterize, or communicate it to you. I can't complicate it. I can't... I can't express this to you except to tell you that it's true that the same everlasting, never-changing, ever-present God, the same all-knowing, all-seeing, all-loving, ever-powerful God, not only spoke into the unfathomable depths of darkness in this universe and said, let there be light, but now God says today to you, you are light. And that's how we go to a whole nother level.